and welcome to Meet the Author, a program that is brought to you by Quincy Access Television and the Thomas Crane Public Library. During this show, we will highlight authors and their work. Copies of their books are available for checkout at the Thomas Crane Public Library. Also, the library hosts book clubs for all ages, and you can find out more information about them if you visit the library's website, thomascranelibrary.org. Chris, thanks for joining me today to talk about your book. Pleasure. People who may or may not remember, you are a fabulous historian that we just love to have come and visit us. And your recent book is When the Irish Invaded Canada, which is about Civil War vets, uh, I understand. How did you get interested in this in this topic? How did you first find out about it? I never heard about this invasion before. Uh, yeah, and like many Americans, I hadn't either. And I was doing the research for Strong Boy, and I yeah. came across a mention of one of John L. Sullivan's ring opponents being a veteran of the attack on Canada. Uh, so we're doing yeah, a well, double take, what, what is this yeah. and what did I miss? And the more I did the research into it, it's this amazing, relatively unknown story about a group of Irish Americans who had to flee the great hunger in Ireland, come to the United States, fight on both sides of the Civil War, and then unite to uh, undertake one of the most fantastical missions in military history, which is to kidnap Canada and ransom it for Ireland's independence. And how did that go for them? Didn't go too well, spoiler <laughs> alert. It did, yeah. the, the plan did not work, but uh, they didn't do it just once. They did it five times between, Get out. Five really? times between 1866 and 1871 yeah. in what are collectively known as the Fenian Raids. Wow. So they were definitely persistent. Uh, but for 700 years, the Irish had tried to cast off the British and a series of revolutions in Ireland didn't work, but that didn't mean that they didn't stop trying, and this was just a different way of trying to achieve that that end and keep the revolutionary spirit alive. How many people are we talking about who did this? Or is this just a handful of uh, people who decided to go up to Canada on a lark or is this like, a, you know, how big is the scale? So it, they're, it, probably the largest force that they actually had to cross into Canada in one of these attacks was about 800 men. That's significant. Um, yeah. yeah, and the, the organization that was behind it was called the Fenian Brotherhood. Okay. And at their height in 1866 after the Civil War, there were tens of thousands of members of this organization wow. across the United States. And th this was is just an Irish pride organization? What was the Fenian Brotherhood? So it, the Fenian Brotherhood was established in 1858 as a revolutionary organization in America. Yep. And there was a sister organization called the Irish Republican Brotherhood back in Ireland. Mm. And the idea was that in the United States, uh, with the freedoms that America offered, the Irish who had come to America were going to raise money and purchase weapons that they were going to ship back to Ireland to lead to, to a revolution there. Ireland. And you know, this is a framework that they established that is actually still in place in recent memory with Northern Ireland and, and, and the IRA. And mm -hmm. I think it's worth mentioning that the Irish who invaded Canada called themselves the Irish Republican Army as okay. well. They were yeah. the I, also the IRA. So uh, this, this was an organization completely formed to cast off British rule in Ireland. And when the British cracked down on the organization in Ireland in 1865, 1866, it sort of led to this idea among the Fenian members of the United States, well, why are we trying to do this revolution all the way across the ocean when we can get on an overnight train walk right across the border and be on British soil, which at that time, Canada was a province of Great Britain at the time. Right. Wow. So, and you said they fought on both sides of the Civil War That's here. Right. That, I imagine that was challenging for them to come together, or is this, did, was it a family that had been divided? Did you find out much about you know, that, the, those tensions? Yeah, so there's, a, so there's an Irish scholar named Damien Shields who's done a lot of research in this area, and he estimates that there were 200,000 native Irish who fought for the Union cause in okay. the Civil War and 20,000 who fought for the Confederacy. Okay. And who you fought for was really um, mainly a matter of geography. Where did they settle when they came to America? So a lot of the Irish settled in New Orleans, and there was an Irish regiment called the Louisiana Tigers that veterans of that regiment participated in the Fetian raids uh, on Canada. So for a lot of the Irish, they actually saw their Civil War service as a training ground for the real war they wanted to fight, which was against the British. They figured they would go enlist in the Civil War. They never expected it to last four years, like most uh, you know, people on both sides didn't expect it to last too long. But they expected they would get 
uh, training in use of weapons and battlefield tactics, and then they would use that to plan the revolution. To take back to Ireland or decide Correct. they would go closer to Canada. And, and the, the, the man who puts together the real big battle plan for the invasion of Ireland, which called for a force of about 25,000 men, all right. Uh, did not get didn't that many, get that didn't many, many, that many yeah. show up. But uh, was man uh, General Thomas William Sweeney, who was a veteran of the Mexican-American War and a veteran of the Civil War and was uh, one of Sh General Sherman's trusted hmm. advisors. So, you know, this is not some, you know, escapade that was it's done over a, a few Guinnesses <laughs> and drawn up on the back of a napkin. This is a... a a well-planned operation that actually had the tacit approval of the White House as well. So it's known at the, at the upper levels of the American government what this group was intending to do. Wow, that's fascinating. So the U.S. actually kind of, if, if not endorsing it, turned a, it turned turned a, blind, a blind eye. eye. Exactly. So yeah. the Fenians actually have a meeting with President Johnson in the White House yeah. sort of to lay out, well, you know, what would happen if we... Had an army, went and invaded Canada. Formed an army here and invaded your exactly. neighbor. Yeah. So, uh, wow. and Johnson basically said he would turn a blind eye to it. He couldn't wow. endorse it, but he wouldn't do anything to stand in their way either. And that's just because of, there was a tremendous hostility towards Great Britain in the United States after the Civil War because mm. uh, it was in British ports where Confederate warships were built and the British had stayed neutral, which to the American eyes was a tacit endorsement of the Confederacy. So at mm -hmm. the end of the war, uh, Johnson was pressing the British to pay millions of dollars of reparations for all the damage caused by Confederate warships. Mm -hmm. And into his office come the Fenians and have this plan. And he figures it's a way to place Stick leverage on the, the British, British. <laughs> to get, the, get these millions of dollars paid to the American government. Well, so they, they conducted these campaigns over four or five years, you said? Yeah. Did, how far into Canada did they go? So their their biggest success they had was in 1866. They do get into Ontario, and there's a battle in which the Irish emerge victorious. Wow. Um, and it is a uh, you know a legit battle. Twenty men on both sides die at this at this mm -hmm. uh, at this battle, and yeah. it is the, it will be the first victory by an Irish army over forces of the British Empire since 1745. So it's uh, sort of a seminal moment in, in Irish Over uh, years, Irish yeah. American history uh, oh. that not too many people in Irish America certainly these days know much about. Yeah. And so what happened after these campaigns failed? Did they just kind of disappear to the Finian Brotherhood? Did it kind of, it, it, does it still exist? Did it become the IRA that, that we, we, we know from more, more recent times? So the, or, the Fenian Brotherhood Organization of the United States will carry on for about another decade after the last of their attacks, but yeah. it really was mostly in name only, didn't, didn't mm. really have much uh, power to it. The organization really loses its lifeblood once the United States government makes a deal with the British to pay the millions of dollars in reparations. Mm -hmm. And it, losing that Anglophobia, was, which was sort of the lifeblood, sort of, sort of derailed the cause. And then just these failures after failures of, of trying to do the invasions. Um, but there is a through line from the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the sister organization that was founded in Ireland, will still be in existence uh, when the Easter Rising happens in 1916 and then wow. the War for British Independence. Uh, that organization is still there. So that, that, that's a through line There's from line. the IRB to the, the IRA and up through the present day in Northern Ireland. Cool. Did any of the uh, the Irish come from, I, I mean, I assume it was, or they were involved in it all over uh, the uh, the. Uh, the states. Um, what was the, was there a Boston angle? Do you know where these guys are from? So we do have such a proud Irish heritage here. Yeah, uh, in Boston and Quincy. Yeah. So it, it, there was an attack in 1866, and another one in 1870 that was launched from northern Vermont into okay. Quebec. And uh, the Fenian Brotherhood, not surprisingly, had quite a few members in the Boston area and in surrounding mill cities like Lawrence and Wool, which were very heavy recruiting grounds for the Fenian Brotherhood. So men from the Boston area literally got on a train, took an overnight train up to St. Albans, Vermont, where they got off and got their way up to the border to, you know, march the next morning up into, into Canada. So there was this Boston connection that is hmm. uh, in those invasions that were launched from Vermont into Quebec.
That is fascinating. So uh, the book came out uh, recently. When would it? Uh, five days before St. Patrick's Day. All right, uh, there you go. Appropriately enough, yes. Are you working on something else right now? Um, just I, I got a few ideas uh, yeah. that I'm trying to see if there's a good enough story, but nothing yet that I so know that still, that's going to be the next. Still one. researching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Still searching for the right one to sort of hit the sweet spot. Yeah. Well, that is super exciting. I, I know there's a lot more stories here for people to explore and, and for, for you to tell. 50 years ago was the pilgrimage to Woodstock. John Kane, his new book, and some never-seen-before photographs all about the pilgrims of Woodstock in a 50-year retrospective. I'm talking today with John. John, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Clayton. I appreciate it. So, did you take these photographs, or how did you, you acquire them? <laughs> certainly, certainly not. Uh, I'm a Gen Xer, and... Yeah. Uh, I, I get that look a lot from uh, the baby boomer uh, demographic, like, you wrote a book about Woodstock? Were you even there? Um, no, I, um, you know, the, how I came upon uh, writing this book was through another book that's coming out in late uh, 2019 called uh, The Last Seat in the House, The Story of Hanley Sound. And the subject of that book is a gentleman by the name of Bill Hanley from Medford, Massachusetts. He was the sound engineer of Woodstock. Um, about nine small chapters of that book are dedicated to his efforts and his crew's efforts in deploying sound reinforcement at the Woodstock Festival. Through that effort uh, in writing and, and researching that project, um, I've become somewhat of a Woodstock scholar um, in basically interviewing uh, every living uh, individual who was part of the, uh, had some part in the production of that festival uh, in relation to Bill Hanley. And uh, that, you know, that also includes uh, Woodstock attendees, uh, the, Wood the Living Woodstock Ventures uh, production staff or producers of the festival, and others that were at the Fillmore East venue, which migrated over from that venue to Woodstock to help facilitate that iconic festival. Uh, so that book came out of a doctoral dissertation in 2014, and kind of a, uh, to really summarize, uh, from 2015 to 2017, I rewrote that uh, dissertation into a book which got picked up by the University Press of Mississippi uh, and a, lo a long line of rejection letters uh, <laughs> from my proposals from that book which is normal uh, I suspect, I hope uh, I think that's absolutely uh, normal <laughs> every author I've ever talked to, if you can't take rejection you got no, no you should not be in the business yeah. I know, I know uh, the University Press of Indiana said hey we really like what you wrote uh, about Bill Hanley and Woodstock the 50th is coming up would you be interested in writing a book uh, for more for a trade audience, a broader audience, less scholarly, but more for, not, I don't even like to say average reader, but just less, less of a scholarly approach. More accessible, uh, we'll call it. More accessible, yeah. yeah. Um, shorter, of course. I mean, the Hanley right. book's about 600 pages. And more um, pictures, I hope. Yeah. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, so I said, yes, I, I actually have, um, in my head, I said, yes, I have, this collection, this wonderful collection of photographs that I that I own, that I acquired mm -hmm. from an estate of a, a photographer named Brooklyn-based photographer named Richard F. Bellack. Bellack has since deceased. 2015, uh, his estate went up uh, with with no heirs. He Bellack had no uh, brothers, sisters, cousins, no family, and it sat for a while. And many people in the Woodstock community uh, who are researchers, historians like myself, were kind of eyeing this, uh, this collection out, and I, I was fortunate enough to acquire it. And, um, and I was, in those pictures, I was looking for Hanley, really. I was looking for sound uh, images, images of the sound towers, images of the production crew. Mm -hmm. So I basically just had it, negatives and all. And um, I thought, well, what about a book about, uh, since I have all this uh, access to uh, these wonderful interviews and people, a book about just the audience experience, where it is the 50th, and um, the real, many people have said the real performers were not the musicians on the stage, but really the, the performance by the audience, you know, how the audience got along and how they kind of worked together to make that weekend so special. I can't believe, so I, I, was, I was just looking at, at the description, there were 400,000 people, I mean, Woodstock looms large in the popular kind of in, in popular culture everybody knows of it but to think that f was it really that many people well you have to put this all into perspective uh, mass gatherings uh, were not uncommon before and after Woodstock um, you know okay. beginning with Mo Monterey pop in right. 1967 yeah. 
you know, uh, popular music, uh, as, as the quality of, of uh, production equipment got better, uh, popular music grew, radio, FM radio uh, was on the rise, and uh, there you have it. And, um, you know, more of that counterculture was meeting uh, in larger groups at these multi-day, uh, multi-performance events. And, uh, I, I, you know, I firmly believe it just grew and grew and grew, and it spilled over at Woodstock. But that summer, uh, bef- the July, uh, 4th of July weekend of that summer, 1969, there was another festival, uh, the Atlanta Pop Festival, and mm-hmm. I believe it was in Byron, Georgia, and that was about two hundred thousand people. They say more, but there's really no way to calculate that yeah, many. It's really hard to count that many people. <laughs> <laughs> but four hundred thousand, I think, is fairly accurate. Um, Max Yasgers, he was one of the the farmer, the famed farmer of yep. uh, of Woodstock that leased the land to Woodstock Ventures. He uh, he was the largest uh, farmer landowner in that area in mm-hmm. Sullivan County. 600 acres so you know when you look at photos the the crowd was really sprawling so i i i believe an accurate number is about 400,000 maybe 450,000 they weren't expecting much but yeah how does that compare with festivals today i mean if you think of boston calling or bonnaroo or you know uh, uh, coachella that just happened you know how many people go to those well uh i think less and i think um there are the, the, the infrastructure, uh, there is now an, a, a, a formal uh, systematic infrastructure in place now with festivals. Um, right. You know, there are checkpoints, there are tickets, there, there are ticket gates, uh, uh, there are fences, uh, there are police. Uh, right. You know, all these things are, and these are, the festivals of today are truly model, modeled after Woodstock or what, mo- what Woodstock should have been. And Woodstock mm. in many ways was chaotic. It was there were there was none of that, you know. Yeah. So you just had people spilling in with no control, um, and that's the miracle, and and that's the myth is that um, uh, amid all of the chaos, you had harmony, and that mm-hmm. I think is the lore, the myth and lore of Woodstock. Well, uh, so you must have gotten, and with all these photographs, there must be an incredible, and all the conversations you've had, mm. there must be just an incredible range of stories that you've heard. Uh, with that many people and all the people that you've talked to, um, I wonder if you might share a couple, like a little bit, little samples to kind of tease people. I didn't want it to be, and I was firm about this with the publisher, that I didn't want it to be another, because when you look on Amazon or any other book outlet, there are lots of books about Woodstock, a lot of books with photographs, and, you know, what sets Pilgrims of Woodstock apart. Yeah. Um, And uh, I was strong... Uh, about uh, keeping the book less about the hippie, drippy, acid trippy uh, kind of approach, oh. psychedelic tie dye, and more uh, of, a, of a, 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 I should say, a, a respectful classic approach. You weren't uh, trying to exoticize it. You were trying to just say, all right, these yeah. are regular people that were, you know, just like you and me, uh, who were interested in seeing some music and hanging out with their friends. It, uh. it, that that, and when you look at the photos. Uh, and when you when you hear people talk about Woodstock now, uh, it's it is a ce- it's a celebratory thing. Yeah. But when you look at the photos, most of the individuals look pretty miserable. I mean, they're not uh. they're not entirely happy. They're in the mud. It's really stinky. Uh, you know, there's lack there's lack of resources, food, water. It was, it was not comfortable. Of, yeah. It was. It was. <laughs> it was a feat uh, yeah. to get through that weekend. And it's on the faces uh, and on the sleeves of these uh, these this youth culture of the day. Um, so in my approach, it was really important for me to interview a cross section of, and a diverse cross cross section, I should say, of attendees, women. Uh, I wanted to hear from women and what it was like to be a woman, and at the height or the beginning of the women's liberation movement. I wanted to hear from a Vietnam veteran, someone who was right out from the war. I wanted their perspective because Woodstock wasn't. A, many will say Woodstock was a political event, but it really wasn't that much when you when you watch the movie and you you see uh the crowd uh the, there wasn't too much it wasn't like a demonstration an anti-war demonstration uh it was a celebration of music uh and art um so uh it was important for me to, to hear what a veteran fresh from the vietnam war would have uh, would have uh, uh, uh you know saw or felt um mm-hmm. those who from other uh, parts of the world that was really difficult I, I managed to interview someone from Canada um, the West Coast was a much different scene uh, they were going through a different uh, you know kind of 
folk rock psychedelic scene? What was it like to come to the East Coast and, and feel that kind of cultural difference? Um, and uh, yeah, so and, and of course, uh, Hispanic, black representation, very important uh, for me to talk to those individuals as well. I think I did a pretty good job. If I had more time, I would have interviewed 50. <clears throat> I interviewed 40 and then picked the cherry picked the best, so I interviewed about 30. Uh, individual. So stories. In the book, uh, I have the story of the couple that are on the cover of the Woodstock album, the Urkelines, and they talk about how they heard they were local people and how they heard about the festival and how they ventured in and happened upon getting the photograph on the album. It's a really interesting uh, story. Mm. Um, you know, uh, I interviewed. If, have you ever seen the movie before? I have, or at least I've okay. seen snippets. I don't know if I've sat through the whole thing. Right. But, yeah, uh. there, there was a guy named R Wayne Rogers, his, and you know, a lot of people back then had nicknames. His nickname was Turkey. Okay. Uh, and I forget why, but I'm no because he looked <laughs> he kind of looks like a turkey. I okay. Guess. That's what he would say. Uh, he's in the movie, uh, the Woodstock, doc the Academy Award-winning documentary Woodstock by Michael Wadley. He is in the film, and he's the gentleman that comes out of the uh, port of sand with a hash pipe. Okay. And, you know, when he, when he comes out of that port of sand, he's interviewed, and it's very brief. He gives the whole backstory as to why he was in the port of sand. I just found that extremely interesting. It's like, well, this uncovered uh, information, because so much has been written about Woodstock. You know, what was like, what we, why were you in the port of sand? Well, he was, he was in the port of sand with six other individuals, if you can imagine, <laughs> trying to get out of the wind. To light a hash pipe and right. then he comes out first and then he says it was martin scorsese who was interviewing him uh, and the so it's just like you know that's beautiful you know when you when you when you uh, uncover that hmm. um i think one other that one other interview that really stands out for me is uh, is the vietnam uh, uh veteran who was uh, in the tet offensive he entered vietnam during the tet offensive which was i believe in 67 or 68 hmm. and um you know, he, it was a difficult interview because he was crying during mm. my interview with him. So I almost, I had to, ethically, I said, well, listen, we don't have to do this. You know, we right. could just stop. Yeah. And he said, he felt strongly that it need, he said, no, this interview needs to be done and I want it in the book. So mm. it was my, uh, you know, my responsibility at that point to, to tell his story and put that story in the book. So when you read Pilgrims of Woodstock, you are immersed in these individuals' uh, experiences only hmm. at the festival. Um, we learn only of their first name, only of their age, and we, we, we stop where they leave. We don't learn about them becoming stockbrokers or, you know, right. parents and all that. It's, it's, it was my effort to create a time capsule because hmm. Bellac's images are different than... The, the you won't you will not find my individuals uh, interviewed in the Bellac images. Maybe you if with you know with a magnifying glass somewhere, but how do you merge those two? So when I was looking at the Bellac images, I pulled themes and questions from those, mm -hmm. and that drove the content, uh, uh, the inquiry, on how I would interview these um, uh, attendees. And it and by doing that, everything just came together. So you just have this beautiful. Uh, bubble, uh, uh, time capsule, I should say, um, which is just all encapsulated. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, that is really, I'm really looking forward to seeing the book. I, I'm really excited yeah. to have you here. Um, it sounds like there's going to be a lot for people who maybe were alive at the time of Woodstock, but also a lot for people who are interested in framing it and, and looking at how it relates to, you know, our existence today and, and new ways of looking at it. People obviously can see, you know, the movie's been out for a long time. Uh, sure. It's been part of our popular you know, uh, the kind of the mythology around the 60s, uh, and, and it has used, been used to symbolize so much, but I'm, I'm really excited to hear these stories. I think uh, hopefully some people will even be inspired to go and look at a little bit deeper and look at some of your more historic pieces um, uh, and, and get some deeper analysis. So I think, and it couldn't be more timely to be doing it here when there's a clash of cultures that's, you know, happening, you know, has been happening since. There's been many, uh, I think, cultural revolutions that, you know, some people say sparked or were at a head there, but we are not out of the woods yet, so. Uh, no, definitely not. I mean, you know, you can, there's a lot mirroring, you know, today. What was, what, you know, what, what was happening then is mirrored now, and, uh, you know, that identification and those connections can be made very easily. Thank you, John.
Yeah, sure. Be sure to check out our other episodes of this program to explore other authors and their works. For more information about library programs and services, visit the Thomas Crane Public Library's website, thomascranelibrary.org, or call them at 617-376-1316.